If there's one thing that could be said about male concubines in ancient India, it's that they could either be privileged and safe behind an imperial palace, or they could be on the streets disrespected and disheveled. It was rare for commoners to take male concubines, even if they were homosexual. Getting caught with a male concubine was enough to be lowered down a caste in ancient India, and who wanted to risk becoming an untouchable with no rights back then? But as in all societies, the rules of the commoners don't translate well into the elite. The Rajput and the Indian royals back then did not share these concerns with the commoners, however, because they could have as many male concubines as they wanted as long as they kept it hidden. How was this life of mystery for the lucky concubines, though? Let's find out today with New Found History. One of the significant expectations of concubines, particularly in the context of royal house Households was to bear children. Their role was to provide heirs or successors to the ruling elite, ensuring the continuation of the lineage. Since male concubines were not capable of procreating, instead they had the expectation of also being competent at other matters of statecraft. To serve as attendants to royals, male concubines had to be skilled in martial arts and combats. They also were expected to remain loyal to the rulers and partners and to keep discretion regarding their intimate affairs. You see, India's caste social status system is more rigid than many other medieval societies. Caste was determined by birth, inherited from the parents, making marriage alliances practically the only reliable way to climb up in status. This was hypergamy. Marriages were primarily seen as a means of forging alliances, maintaining family traditions, and ensuring the continuity of noble lineages. That also meant many un happy marriages were formed. The focus was on alliances and family honor. If you married up, you'd be seen as successful. And while some were content with the success of fulfilling their societal roles, others were dissatisfied, leading to them secretly taking concubines, both males and females, to adventure out of their rigid caste system. And who was happier than them with the privileges handed to them, along with their status? Anything they desired, fine horses for riding and even servants to attend them outside. Ironically enough, many of the male concubines could even obtain other female slaves inside the imperial household. Concubines to other concubines, if you may. Being a male concubine in ancient India also meant access to the royal's presence and intimacy, being privy to confidential matters of the state, sometimes even playing a part in decision-making. After all, if the males were to be educated in strategy and statecraft, this meant that their input was many times valued. All of this was caused by the practice of hypergamy, which emphasized marrying someone from a higher social status or caste, important for maintaining the purity and prestige of the lineage. It was often within the courtly circle and the entourage of the Rajput nobles that they found potential bridesmaids and concubines of both sexes, and even the third one. But more on this third sex later. On the other hand, Rajputs refrained from taking concubines from the untouchable castes. They rarely took concubines from the Charans and Brahmins, as the former were bards and storytellers closely linked with the Rajput already, and the latter were essentially priests and scholars. Let's say the clergy and the intellectual castes were not the best place to find sexual partners. Needless to say, it was even more unthinkable to take another Rajput as concubine, as they were the ideal partners for traditional marriage, to preserve social standing and continue noble lines. And if you couldn't marry into wealth and status, being a concubine of a wealthy royal was a close consolation prize, especially for females. Both male and female concubines might have even been given rights to income collected from a certain village in time. For some males, things could be entirely different, for which we should understand ancient Hindu views on homosexuality. They were often conflicting and often shaped by religion, and while not punished explicitly in the religious texts of Hinduism, it wasn't celebrated as it was in ancient Greece, for example, with thoughts being neutral at best and antagonistic at worst. The Manu Smriti, also known as the 
the Laws of Manu is an ancient Hindu legal text that provides guidelines for each of the Varnas, the Hindu castes, morality, and sexual conduct. It was said there that the sexual union between two men brought a loss of caste status, which in medieval India could mean a lifetime of drudgery and discrimination for themselves and their descendants. This discouraged the commoners from having male concubines, but it did not affect the ruling elite as much. The royals had their own document, the Arthashastra, the treatise on material gain, an ancient Indian treatise on statecraft, governance, and political economy. It had its reservations toward homosexual intercourse, treating it as a minor offense. There was, however, the Kama Sutra, possibly the most well-known ancient Indian text due to its unbridled focus on sex, with dedicated chapters to erotic homosexual behavior. This was a favorite of Hindu royals to reenact with their male concubines. The Kama Sutra mentions the klibas, a term that encapsulates gay men but that can also include impotent men. They could either be effeminate or masculine, engaged in shallow relationships with one another, and were known to marry each other. Homosexual union between two men or two women was known as Gandharva, a union of cohabitation and love. And despite societal views establishing homosexual love as unnatural or obscene, images that vividly represent these unions populate prayer halls and cave temples of India. In an episode of the Bhagavata Purana, an ancient Hindu scripture, there's the story of Mohini, an enchantress avatar of Lord Vishnu who appears in a female form to bewitch demons. In one instance, Shiva is captivated by Mohini's beauty and becomes infatuated with her. Their interaction is sometimes interpreted as an instance of same-sex attraction. Fast forward to the 16th century and concubinage was still a practice in elite Rajput households where certain slave servants or slave performers could climb the social ladder by becoming concubines. But things changed a little during the Mughal invasion of India. You see, the Mughal Empire came from Central Asia, and due to India's wealth from trade and their vast resources from agriculture, they invaded northern and central India. As a side note, the Mughal Empire is not originally from India, but exercised as the ruling class during its rule in India, and some of their culture was also absorbed into Hindu culture by proxy. Their governance of India reached its apex under rulers like Akbar and his son Jahangir. While polygamy was practiced among the Mughal rulers, it typically involved marriages with women of noble or royal lineage to form political alliances and secure dynastic succession. That was actually part of their strategy to control India, take multiple wives, form political alliances, and ensure their dynasty remained in power. Jahangir had a large harem and a significant number of concubines, many of them having separate quarters within the palace complex. Other Mughal rulers also had many concubines, but Jahangir was the most infamous because while numerous women were among his lovers, there were males too. Jahangir ruled from 1605 to 1627 and was drunk for a great part of his life, only gaining sense when slapped by his father Akbar into duty. He later handed over most of his duties to his 20th and favorite wife, Nur Jahan, and was known for his deep appreciation for the arts. He was a patron of painting, poetry, and architecture, so many of his male concubines would receive education and training in those areas, a privilege they otherwise could only dream of. They were encouraged to develop proficiency in composing and appreciating poetry, which was considered a hallmark of refined education. They were exposed to music, dance, painting, and architecture, and also studied classical Sanskrit and Persian. Yet, what about the third sex we mentioned earlier? Diving a little deeper into the culture imposed by the Mughals in India, certain royals had an attraction to the mysterious or the spiritual. The Tritya Prakiriti were all individuals who underwent castration or were born with intersex traits. They were the prized guards and companions of kings and emperors. In other cultures, they'd be called eunuchs and were neither female nor male, but their own category. Interestingly, this third gender doesn't just mark them as males with removed sexual organs, they actually were thought 
of as having a feminine gender role and a homosexual identity regardless of their sexual orientation or endocrine status. Their presence was thought to bring blessings and good fortune. They are mentioned in ancient texts such as the Kama Sutra and the Mahabharata, but most importantly, they were believed to possess spiritual and ritual powers, and they often performed at religious ceremonies, births, weddings, and other auspicious occasions. Because they were castrated, they were trusted with handling the male and female members of the harem, as it was thought they couldn't exploit them. These were the most privileged hijras, serving as informants between the emperors and the queens or ladies confined behind the purda, a social custom practiced in certain Muslim Hindu communities where women had to conceal their faces and body from observation as an act of faith. They were taken as slaves, but were also slave owners, entertainers, companions, male attendants, and even concubines. They formed close-knit communities known as Hijra Garanas and lived together in designated areas or neighborhoods. That also meant their social role was diffuse. They could either face marginalization, discrimination, and lacked access to employment and education. Yet their perceived mystical and supernatural traits also made people fear, respect, or even desire them. Later, during the British ruling period known as the Raj during the 19th century, British laws criminalized Hijra communities. They were deemed criminal tribes, unnatural offenses, and indecent for the public. Their gender expression was harassed, and whatever meager rights they had back during Mughal rule were unrecognized. But it was precisely this mystical allure and their usual close proximity to the ruling class and the harems that led some of these hijras to positions of power and concubinage in the past. Eager to discover more shocking history? You need to see this.